On Tuesday this week, I was greatly helped when I was preparing for this interview that I'm about to do, when Pope Francis issued a pastoral letter in which he confessed, and I quote, A living church can look back on history and acknowledge a fair share of male authoritarianism, domination, various forms of enslavement, abuse, and sexist violence. He urged the Catholic Church to be attentive to women's legitimate claims for equity and justice. In the context of the season of Lent, which Thomas Merton, that great Catholic mystic, said should be about healing and contemplation rather than punishment and atonement, I can think of no better person with whom to contemplate this matter in a bishop. But no ordinary bishop, a woman bishop, Patricia Friesen, who I've had the privilege to get to know over the last month and discover something of our shared path in seeking to be faithful to the Gospels. Patricia is about to retire, or trying to retire, after a truly remarkable ministry, firstly as a Dominican nun, who got into trouble with the apartheid government for breaking the colour bar by admitting black children into the convent school that she served. And she is now in trouble with the church for having been ordained by a male bishop, by the way, who had in conscience decided that women could not be excluded from priestly ordination. And before she was ordained by him, she had already distinguished herself as a respected theology professor in the faculty of St. John Vianney Seminary. She taught young men what was required to be ordained into the priesthood, except that she could not be a role model for them of what she taught, because the prevailing canon law excluded her from ordination in the Catholic Church. And so she will tell us what happened to cause her to make her claim for equality and justice by seeking ordination. Firstly, into the priesthood, then as a bishop. So Patricia, to frame the telling of your story, I want to just start off by reading a quote from this Nigerian poet and novelist, Ben Okri, mm -hmm. to give a thematic for us to use to guide us and to reflect on your story in terms of his insight. He says, stories are the secret reservoir of values. If we change the stories individuals and nations tell themselves, we change the individuals and nations. If they tell themselves stories that are lies, they will have to bear the consequences of those lies. If they tell themselves stories that confront their own truths, they will free their histories for future flowerings. So Patricia, let's start with your personal story and what truth about yourself did you have to confront so as to free your personal history for the flowerings and the blossoms that it's produced. I taught for years and I was principal of a number of our schools. Uh, I also at one point admitted some black children into a school and got into a lot of trouble with the police. But Dennis Hurley got me out very fast. He sent some people to get me out. Sometime after that I was sent to Rome and I was allowed to study theology. It was the most important thing I'd ever studied. I'd never dreamt that as a woman I would be allowed to do it. I was at the Angelicum, which is the Dominican University of St. Thomas in Rome, and they accepted me as a student because the bishop here, who at that time was Michael Not Coleman, Coleman yes. mm. He said that I would come back and I would teach theology in the seminary. Mm. And the bishops believed that our seminarians needed to get more used to women and especially women with some authority because apparently when our students went out into the parishes they were terrible, some of them, mm. terribly autocratic and treating women very badly. And the bishops thought if we had a few women teaching in the seminary, 
that would help the men there to have a better attitude to women. I was fortunate enough to be one of those and I joined the class. I had done philosophy in Potchefstroom in Afrikaans mm -hmm. um, by Willem de Klerk, who was the brother of, of F. W. de Klerk. Oh, really? The Wimpy de Klerk. Wimpy de Klerk. We, call him, yes, we yeah. call him Prof. Wimpy. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely wonderful. He told me that he had been a Dumanier and he was in that very strict part of the Dutch Reformed Church and uh, one day he did a wedding which was a normal thing for a Dumanier to do but at the reception afterwards the people had a band and they started to dance <laughs> with each other. Now that was not allowed and he was dying to dance and he said to his wife who was there, come on, let's dance. And she said, Wanneer, wat gaan hulle dink? And he said, come on, they're dancing. I'll only dance with you. So they got up and they joined in the dance and they loved it. They had a wonderful afternoon. Later, he was reported to the, the synod, it would have been. And they said, he and his wife were disobeying the rules. This was said to Jesus too, by the way, over things like breaking the Sabbath and so on. One thing was that he had danced with his wife in public and that she wore lipstick <laughs> and terrible things like that. He was so disenchanted by this whole attitude. Although he knew the rules, he thought honestly, those things are not important. There are important things like justice and equality and breaking down racism in this country. And they worry about things like that, that my wife wears lipstick. And I danced with her. He decided to resign as a Dumanier and we got him as our philosophy professor in, at Potts University. I loved his lectures and we, we two got to know each other quite well because one day he said in class, now, I was a Dominican, they all called me sister, mm. and, um, and I used to come by bike, and my white scapula used to f flow out behind me, so they called me the Fleende Hollander. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said to me one day in class, Sister, can I come after this lesson to his office? Mm. And I thought, heavens, what have I done? Mm. What did I write in that last essay? Anyway, when I went in, he said to me, at the end of this year, I'm going on an overseas tour to England and some other countries in Europe, and I have to give lectures in English. He said, they will all be officially translated. I'll write them in Afrikaans. They'll be translated. But he said, you know what I can't do? I can't make ordinary conversation in English. I just don't know the expressions. Would you mind coming to my office, say, once or twice a week, and we'll just talk ordinary conversational English? Because I spoke Afrikaans there, obviously. Yes, and we, we started like that. Mm. But then he started saying, tell me about the cloister, the convent. <laughs> I want to know. He wanted to know a whole lot of things. He wanted to know, he said, can I ask you, have you ever been to confession? And what do you do? And what happens? And so on. He wanted to know all that sort of thing. And I said, tell me, how did you decide to be a Dominia? And what was it like? And what did you do with the people? And um, so we shared quite a lot about our lives and our history. And um, later, when I was in Rome, somebody phoned me and told somebody from here and told me that he had died. Mm. And I was really sad. Mm. And I think he had quite a big influence on his brother, on mm. F.W. F.W. changed his attitude mm. towards racism, and I think a lot of it came from mm. Prof. Empey, from what I know of him. I was sent to Rome. I'd done philosophy. You have to do mm. three years of philosophy before they allow you to study theology. Mm. To be, if you're going to be a priest or if you're going to teach theology. Mm. But I had done my three years of philosophy, very good years with Prof. Mpi. So they let me start 
in theology one. Mm -hmm. And everybody else in the class was male, and they were all seminarians who were going to be priests. I started in the English section, and the lecturers were mostly from England or Ireland. We had some excellent Irish mm -hmm. um, lecturers, and one, for example, Nick King, the Jesuit mm -hmm. from England. And we could also go across the road to the Gregoriana, we called it the Greg, where the, which was a Jesuit university, and we could attend lectures there. Mm -hmm. And they had very good, much more expensive courses, and you could do up to half your courses there and get them mm -hmm. recognized. Mm -hmm. When I was in class, I was learning theology because I was going to teach it. Mm -hmm. But more and more I was invited to their diaconate, first their diaconate ordinations, and l later their bishops would come out, quite a lot of them wanted to be ordained in Rome, mm. and they invited me. And more and more a feeling would come up in me, I would love to be able to do priestly ministry. I would love that. And I used to tell myself, forget it Trish, forget it, it's not allowed. You're a woman, you're lucky enough to study theology and mm -hmm. teach it, but to be a priest is out of the question. It always came up again and again. There was one student in my class in the second or third year who um, was very thin and very sickly, and one day he wasn't in class, and one of the others came to me and said, Patricia, he wants you to come and visit him. He's in hospital. He's in this hospital in Rome. I said, he wants me. He said, yes. That afternoon I got the bus and I, went, I knew where the hospital was. I went into his ward. He was alone. And he told me that he had AIDS, mm. and which I had half suspected. And he said, I have pneumonia and I have some of the other consequences of AIDS and he said, I, I don't think I'm going to make it, which he didn't actually. Mm -hmm. And he said, I would like you to anoint me. I said, me? I said, I can ask any one of the priests, there's so many priests at the Ange and the Greg, and some of your own, I said, I could ask any one of them, they'd come and do it with pleasure. He said, I want you. I said, then I need some oil to anoint you. He said, ask so and so, and he gave me the name of one of his friends who was in the class. He'll get you some. We know where it is in the sacristy. <laughs> so I asked him, and he got it for me. I, I also asked for the little booklet with the prayers, and I got there, and I used the oil to anoint him on his forehead, on his hands, on his heart, on his feet, and I said all the prayers, and then he asked me just to pray freely, and I did, and he did, and he asked me to bless him, and I said, I put my hands on his head, and I said, I pray that God will bless you deeply, and, I, and in the end, um, I made the sign of a cross on his forehead, and he took my hand, and he did this with it. Mm. and. He said to me, Patricia, you should be a priest. I was staggered, absolutely yeah. staggered. He said, you should be a priest. It is terrible that women cannot be priests. Their whole pastoral ministry and their compassion is, could be so useful. He said, I really pray that one day you will be a priest. Now, I've had this longing myself, yeah. but the fact that he seemed to see that in me, astonished me. He died about a week later, and I went to the funeral. I didn't do the funeral, of course. One of the priests did. I went to the funeral, but that somehow lit a spark in me that never went away. It used to come back over and over and over again. You experienced the role of being a priest. Yes. And what, what comes to mind is that you know, when Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, and I want to read this quote from the scriptures, because he was in turn 
interpreting or reading from Isaiah chapter 61 right. about the mission of the prophet where he says the spirit of the Lord Yahweh has been given to me he has anointed me he has sent me to bring good news to the poor to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the blind new sight to set the downtrodden free and to proclaim the Lord's year of favor now I'm hearing you saying that here was a man who was set free by your ministry to him in a sense and who then in some ways was helping unlock your story yes. for subsequent movement into now embracing what was an anointing quite clearly yes it didn't have the formal a mandate from the church that's right but there was an experiential mandate yes how did that then flow from there my longing for priestly ministry got stronger and uh, there were many positive and neg negative experiences that pushed it further I'll tell you a negative one in our fifth year we had been doing four years of systematic theology and among those we had moral theology and the professor came in in the fifth year and said to us now I'm going to go with you through the sacrament of confession because that is one important application of moral theology and uh, my job now is to teach you about the sacrament of confession and the priest's role and what you do and how you approach people pastorally and I will be doing that with you for the next six weeks. I was still the only woman in the class and he looked at me and he said, Sister, you needn't come. He said, you will never have any uh, reason to use this and I'm sure you've got better things to do. So for the next six weeks, you can skip this class. I was angry. He was throwing me out, pointing out that I could never be a priest. I knew I could never be. However, I said to him, Professor, I've paid for this course and I would like to claim my right to be present. Mm -hmm. And he backed off straight away. But he said, if you want to be present, certainly. Mm -hmm. you could, that, that's fine. <laughs> he said, on Monday morning, there will be two chairs here in the front and one will have a priest's stole on it, a purple stole, that's what the priest mm. wears for confession. And I'm going to ask you to volunteer, we're going to do role play. And he said, one of you will be the priest and I will role play the penitent. Mm. He was a priest. And he said, we'll, and then we'll dis we'll, I will go to confession to you mm. publicly. And he said, of course I'll make it all up. When I came in on the Monday morning, we were all there, I got in, sat in my place about halfway up, and the priest came in, said good morning and said a prayer, and then he said, now, as you know, we are going to role play the sacrament of confession, and would one of you please volunteer to, be the, the, to role play the priest? And they, now in Rome, when they want something, <laughs> they slam their books on the desk and they chant and they started chanting we want Patricia we want Patricia they had made this out among themselves they hadn't told me and of course they hadn't told you now both the both the lecture the professor and I were absolutely taken aback I was expecting to sit there and watch them go through this is not easy to do especially in front of your classmates Oh the last thing I expected was that. However, they went on chanting, We want Patricia. <laughs> he said, Are you willing? Mm. I said, All right. So I thought, Heaven help me. Now I really have to think. So I went down to the front and mm. they were still. And I picked up the stole and I said to him, Shall I put it on? He said, Yes, you're role playing the priest. So I put a stole on for the first time in my life and I sat down and he sat opposite me and he said to all of us, I'm a 23 year old young man and um, um, I have a fairly wild life and I'm 
again, I'm now coming to confession. And I started with the initial blessing that I read, and I was really nervous, especially in front of all my classmates. <laughs> I wasn't ready for this. And he confessed that he had made a, a, a girl pregnant, but he they had agreed they didn't want to get married, um, and that he was thinking of coming to the seminary. And he also confessed that he had spoken to some friends about one of his other friends, and he had told some lies about him. So when it came to the discussion and the penance, I said to him, what are you going to do about supporting this child? You're the father of the child. You're going to have to support the mother. And if you're thinking of the seminary, you will still have, you are still the father of that child. I said, I think it's a disgrace that people make a woman pregnant and then just leave her to cope. So we discussed this and he said, I haven't got very much money. So I said, you're going to have to make a plan if you've got a job. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently he, had, he used to just get temporary jobs, he said. I said, you're going to need to get a job and you're going to need to find a way of supporting her. And secondly, I got to the part about he'd been telling lies about somebody. I said, I want you to go back to that group and tell them that what you said wasn't true. He said, I'll die of shame. I said, probably you will. It's hard to do, but that's your penance. I'm not giving you three Our Fathers and three Hail Marys. I want you to go back to the, your, the group to whom you said those things and admit that what you said was not true. And I want you to promise that you will do something to support the mother of that child. And, and then I took the thing, I said, and now if you agree to those, I'll give you absolution. And he said, yes, uh, uh, he, he acted very well. He, was, mm. he said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. He said, I didn't think of all this. I said, all right, are you willing to do those two things? Mm. Yes, he was. So I said, I'll give you absolution, and I read it off. Mm. And uh, he went off, and the class applauded me. Wow, and I must so say that even there, later, then and later, I had a feeling. I, I honestly feel called to priesthood. It's, isn't it terrible that uh, just because I'm a woman, I can't? But that so resonates, because as a social worker, I've had so many people real life situations that you describe. People yes. who have gone and made a mess of things there no. in crisis. I can only lead them so far. I can't give them absolution. I don't have a sacramental thing. And part of what I'm wanting to say to them is, I'd like to refer you to a priest so that you can unburden yourself. Because there's a potential for restorative justice, which goes back to what Jesus yes. was saying. Restoration. Yes. And we use a cliche, to make lemonade out of this bitter lemon. Oh, and that, there's not enough priests available. Meeting Diane Wilman now, who's now latest ordinance, meeting Mary Ryan in Cape Town. I'm just so excited that at last we can start finding this complementarity of roles yes. so that there can be that fuller sense of church becomes, you know, as Paul says, a, a unity. The work of service, building up of the body of Christ. Diane manifests God's love, God's acceptance, and God's compassion. And in so doing, she lives the word. So let's talk about from your personal story now to the church's story. In many ways, compromised because of these okay rules and regulations. Rules, yeah. the, the Pope said, and that was John Paul II at the time, the church has no authority to ordain women. He said, Jesus never ordained women. He ordained the 12 men. That's absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't ordain anyone. Mm -hmm. The Last Supper was not an ordination. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me. He says it to the community. Ordination as a sacrament came in in about the fourth century. Up to then, people were deacons or priests or bishops, and there were women in Rome in some of the churches there are wonderful mosaics, and one of them that I loved was Episcopa Theodora, the, the Bishop Theodora, and she's with some women priests, and they're celebrating 
Eucharist. Really? Yes. And um, so there's lots of that in Rome. And I discovered things in the catacombs mm. that I had never known mm. about women priests and deacons in the first three or four centuries. But once the church introduced the official ordination ceremony, they were also becoming, they were under Constantine, and they, they started copying the princes. Mm. The important ones started wearing mitres to look important and look as though they were, uh, they are the princes of the church and so on. And they started then, from the fourth century on, started excluding women. Mm. There were still women deacons up to the sixth century, deacons, mm. but no longer priests for those mm. fifth and sixth centuries. I mean, I was taught that, you know, authority, to that word authority, mm. it was a result of an integration of scripture tradition and experience. Now you've shared your experience, mm -hmm. your priestly experience. Mm -hmm. You've now told in the, the tradition of the church yeah. there were women priests. Even in, yes, women priests and the ones that are mentioned mainly are the deacons and uh, Paul mentions them in some of his letters. We have names and uh, of women who were uh, certainly deacons and in the catacombs and in some of the churches in Rome, there are the names of women priests and women bishops even. Mm. So yes, it's scripture, tradition, and, and your the experience. And our experience. And that's the question I, which I find interesting because in, in the Acts of the Apostles, after Pentecost, we have the Apostles causing havoc. The, the Sanhedrin's trying to put a, a lid right. on this. And there's that wonderful passage in Acts chapter 4 where yeah. and Malio's intervention right. where yeah. remember that experience, that experience, these things fizzled out. Leave these men alone because if this thing is of God not only will we not be able to stop it but we will be fighting against God. Yes. Now does that imply that I need to go to the Vatican and try and get the private audience with the Pope and say you know Holy Father Experience, tradition, scripture, by their fruits shall you know them. Leave these women alone. Let's see if this yes. is of the Spirit. It's of God. Oh. For goodness sake, why are you now in this position where the, you have been excommunicated and all the other women priests that you are not considered to be... To be validly ordained. That's right. Yes. Excommunication means you cannot receive the sacraments, particularly communion, mm -hmm. until you repent and recant and have gone to confession and then you can go back. Once when I was in Canada, I was asked to give a public talk and the hall was pretty full. I told my story and they asked me all kinds of questions and one woman put her hand up rather timidly and she said, Patricia, uh, how can you stand being excommunicated? She said, it must be the most terrible thing. She said, I've been a Catholic all my life and the most awful thing I can imagine is that I would be thrown out of the church by excommunication. That's what she thought it meant. She said, how do you stand it? How can you live with that? Mm. I said, I've been formally excommunicated as well as what they call automatic excommunication uh, altogether about 39 times. I was, I've been over to the United States many times to ordain the women there, although after three years there were enough women priests in the States that we could elect bishops and they now do the ordinations. However, in the beginning I ordained all the first lots. and. Every time I did it, I knew I, I was automatically excommunicated. I very much admire Pope Francis, and he really has a heart for the poor, mm -hmm. and he lives very simply, um, and he has many enemies in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he doesn't live in the Vatican. He has a room in that B&B mm -hmm. uh, called Santa Marta, mm -hmm. and he lives there, and he has meals with the people in the house. And one of the journalists said to him one day, Holy Father, for centuries the Pope has eaten his meals 
on his own, served by two adoring nuns. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you not continue that? Why do you eat with all these people? And he said, well, for one thing, I want to get to know them. But he said, secondly, it's less easy to poison me if I'm helping myself from the yeah. food and eat. I believe that Pope John Paul I was poisoned mm. after a month. You yeah, remember? Yeah, very him? suspicious. Yes. And this one has so many enemies because he's too radical and he's too anti-clericalist. Mm. And there are many people in the Curia, in the Vatican, who would want to get rid of him. But he has a very Latin American approach to women. Mm. And as far as I can tell, he doesn't believe that women should be priests. Mm. And in this article you were reading to us earlier, he says that women rightly say that they are treated badly in the Catholic Church and they need more authority, but he, knew, he doesn't even go as far as saying we should ordain them as deacons, although there's a group now that are investigating the whole question of women deacons. I don't believe that under Francis mm. he will do that, and in fact it would probably be the most dangerous thing he could say. I see. I can because he does use the word legitimate claims for yes. equality of justice. You probably say, well, this is an illegitimate claim. Yes. It is with great joy I present to you our newly ordained priest, Diane Wilman. <laughs> Clearly, you are led by conscience, and as I've got. To know, you know Diane, Diane, that she's clearly motivated by conscience. And the Guardian et Spes, which of course is one of the Second Vatican Council encyclicals that, that have emerged, preaches the primacy of conscience and that we must be obedient. Now let me just quickly tell you briefly some of my own experience. Again, Archbishop Hurley, who played such a big role in your life, in my life too, as a young white male I was subject to military conscription in the 80s. Oh, yes. And I came to the decision eventually that I could no longer serve in conscience. They, they did by that stage change the law to allow people with bona fide religious objections to be given alternative service so we didn't have to wear the uniform. I had to submit a statement and appear before a tribunal which had a judge and some theologians present to make sure we weren't just draft dodgers yes. and that we were genuinely held the convictions we professed, yes. and the Catholic Church said, sorry, we're not sending any theologian to sit on that tribunal because no human being is competent to sit in judgment of another person's conscience. It's between that person That's and God. True. I mean, in the story you've just told about how this poor man who asked you to anoint him yes. close to his deathbed, yes. It's hard empirical fact now mm. that there was something more than just your ego or your anger or yeah. even something else at work here. This is clearly of the spirit. So surely there's a contradiction here. Yes. And, and Archbishop Hurley's ministry to me when I went to him to get guidance, he said to me, John, we are just bishops, you know, the bishops can teach, the priests can preach. But it's you as the laity who are the ones that must bear witness to the gospel. Uh -huh. We're here to bring about changes. We can't pray yes. the Lord's Prayer and not yes. expect things to change. Yes. You know, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. There needs to be a reordering, a transformation. There are people out there in the church who are waiting to be ordained, to, to find their apostolate. The world needs it. I learned something that I read in a book by Nelson Mandela. Somebody asked him about his years on Robben Island mm. and he said it was an unjust punishment for breaking an unjust law. Mm. And I thought that's the same with us mm. on a much lesser scale. Mm. I mean, he had, what, 28 years in prison mm. and a terrible time. Nevertheless, for us, excommunication which means you may not receive the sacraments lawfully legally it doesn't mean you're out of the church excommunication is an unjust punishment for breaking an unjust law mm. 
and therefore we ignore it. And I actually do not believe that if and when I arrive at the pearly gates, that Peter or Jesus or anyone is going to come and unroll and say, mm -hmm. Patricia, how many thousand times have you been ordaining people or celebrating Eucharist and you are excommunicated other way? Go down. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that God takes any notice of the excommunication of us mm -hmm. women and of the bishops who have ordained us and of the people who come to our masses, mm -hmm. because apparently all of them are automatically excommunicated. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a made-up thing to frighten mm -hmm. people, and I do not believe that it's true. Because let's face it, a lot of priests are, a lot of bishops are, be in favour of women's ordination. And I'm pretty sure if Archbishop were earlier alive today, he would be wanting to see it. Now, there's a concern that maybe he never became a cardinal because he was but known he, to have yes. fairly kind of discomforting... He asked awkward yes. questions. He did. Yes. Now, does this relate to the whole problem, this yes. terrible sexual abuse that we've seen in the church? Yes, it is terrible. And, but I do believe that the enforced celibacy of Catholic priests plays quite a big role in the sexual abuse that mm. takes place, I really do. The priests are evaluated before they are ordained, the male priests. Mm. All the people in the seminary, except the spiritual director, who knows mm. a lot and that is confidential. Mm. Everybody else has to vote on this man, whether they think he, sh he is ready for ordination and whether he is the right person to be ordained. And one of the things that they have in mind, some of them, is would he support women's ordination because mm. that would be a negative. Mm. But what is even stronger is if a priest is being considered to be as a bishop, as a possible bishop, mm. he has to promise in writing that to the Vatican that he will not support women's ordination. Mm. It's one of the conditions for his being ordained a bishop. Mm. To prevent the apostolic succession happening, because you are a priest by apostolic succession. I am, I am in apostolic succession. The bishop who ordained me is a bishop in Europe to protect him. I'm not allowed to say from which country. It's not Germany. Mm. It's a European country. I'm not allowed to give his name. That's mm. something we have agreed on. Mm. But he stands in apostolic succession. Mm. After he had ordained me a bishop, he gave me mm. uh, several sheets of parchment mm. on which the apostolic succession that he stands in, his name was the second last name, and the last name was mine, Patricia mm. Friesen. I was the first woman since the 11th century to be ordained a bishop, and he said to me, I have to tell you, I stand in full apostolic succession, and I must tell you, this is a very good line. I laughed <laughs> a little bit, and, I, and he didn't think it was funny. And then I said to him, can you explain why is it a good line that yeah. you're implying that some are not so good? He said to me, look here, this one, and this one, and this one, and he said there were seven of them that became popes. So oh, really? see, see. that they later they became, became popes. Popes. And that means that they were very good people, and you stand in this line oh, of apostolic goodness. succession. Isn't that funny? But I think that's funny. It is funny. It's interesting because I'm somebody who is very almost rebellious towards uh -huh. authority, and I have uh -huh. to at times be, make sure that I'm not just uh -huh. being rebellious for the sake because yeah. that's my hard wiring. I've got to show the empathy for all the other spaces. How in the fabric of the Catholic Church, people who really feel they need authority from the Church, and once the Church has given its blessing, well then they will be okay with it, and they will be delighted with it. Yeah, many people are like that. And also from an historical perspective, things can go really badly wrong if there isn't some recourse to authority, and I'm saying authority, not power. How do you see things playing out economically and ecologically, the climate change? We really need the church to be salt and light. We women priests believe that we have to break the law. Jesus said to 
uh, when his uh, disciples were eating the corn on the Sabbath, and that was forbidden, it was one of the Jewish laws. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, for human beings, not human beings for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And the same with these church laws. These are also man-made, literally man-made. Mm -hmm. Just as in South Africa, we had to break the apartheid laws in order to bring about more justice. We had mm -hmm. to. So I believe at the moment this is such a strongly held law by the official church mm -hmm. that women cannot be priests, that the only way to change it is to break it. And that's what we do. We break the unjust law. Just before you came, I was reading right. in our creed, mm. and uh, he was giving a, a, a Steve Bicker mm. talk. I was in the convent in King Williamstown when Steve Bicker was killed. He was in prison in King, and um, we knew that he was one of the prisoners, and suddenly the police announced that he had died in prison. Mm. I think all of us believe that he was killed. And they had a funeral in the football grounds, the rugby, the huge grounds in King. It was the only place that was big enough for mm. Steve Picker's funeral. I was one of the Dominicans at the convent, and about eight of us decided to go to the funeral in our habits. We wanted to show our solidarity mm. with the black people of South Africa and with the people like Steve Bicker who suffered such injustice because they stood up for justice. Uh, Archbishop Tutu was one of the speakers. They brought busloads of people down to King, mm. busloads, and they filled up this whole football stadium. And we ten sisters in our white Dominican habits and, and black mantles, but by the time we got there, the stadium was pretty full and we couldn't see anywhere to sit from about nine in the morning to three in the afternoon. I've never stood so long in my life. There were very few white people there. There were a sprinkling here and there. We kind of stood out, especially because of our white habits. But we wanted to. We wanted to show our solidarity. So there were eight white sisters and two black sisters, and quite a number of people came up to us and shook, offered us, and they did the African, the African handshake, and basically, thank you for coming. But one or two were very antagonistic. But one man came up to me, I was at the end of the row, and he shook his fist in my face like that and screamed something. I just stood there, frightened. I was afraid he was going to actually hit me. He didn't. And one other person also came up that stood very angrily and shouted something. I didn't understand it, but uh, most of the people who came up to us shook our hands. That funeral service, later I read a lot about him, I, I became much more anxious to change this racist South Africa. That Steve Bicker funeral had a huge impact on me. And I was very interested to find that, that they have Steve Bicker talks in Cape Town mm -hmm. and that this man from Nigeria, this Ben yeah. Okri, mm -hmm. comes and gives some of them. In terms of that quote, Steve Bicker, he was somebody that was ready to confront the stories yes. that are lies. The term we use in social work is internalized victimhood. This, so in that sense, that confidence that he had, you know, we do not need white people to liberate us and it wasn't an anti-white statement, it was a statement of affirmation of uh, oneself. That's how uh, I understood it. And that yes. impact it had on me being at university was saying, what lie am I living? Uh -huh. And that's how I came to my own uh, growing yes. consciousness, which I still feel is woefully inadequate to the challenges we face. Yes, but mine is still growing. The concern I have is now, how can we use this to better bring about that or that consciousness that you experienced at that funeral on a much wider scale. Yes, well the first answer is that in some ways we have to break the law. Mm. But, and we did, we did break the apartheid laws, some of us, mm. because that helped very much, I believe, to change the law. Mm. In the end it did. Mm. And with regard to the church, 
we have to break this law about women are not allowed to be mm. priests. We simply break the law. It's what we do. Mm. In ecology, I'm horrified at Trump and people in the States who are very ecologically aware mm. and aware of our what we are doing to the planet, they have to break the law very often. Mm. So that's the beginning of change mm. for many of these things, mm. breaking the law. But we also can spread awareness. You are spreading awareness by putting these things on the internet and YouTube. Mm. Yes, because he's telling us that time's nearly up. <laughs> There's one last uh, thread which I just want to tie off with you. But yeah, this, the bringing of the, co the consciousness, I mean, it's interesting to me that scientists and academics and intellectuals have still not quite got any, as it were, scientific explanation for human consciousness that which makes us uniquely human, and, and that, that ability to somehow be more aware. It, it's mm -hmm. something mysterious and, and transcendent. It's not, I just think of Taylor de Chardin's work. Look, he was also somebody in trouble with the church. Yes, he was. And I just find it extraordinary that the yeah. Second Vatican Council was really all about, in many ways, the liberation of a cracking of that, that ridiculous dichotomy that people had made between science and faith and evolution and faith. Yes. And he was able to come up with this extraordinary of understanding. Yes. From solid scriptural understanding too, yes. and the trailblazing that you and Diane and others are doing, is beginning to crack this edifice. Yes. And beginning to loosen things up. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be mistaken. I mean, as I, as a conscience objector, and Magnus Milan came down hard on us for that. Yes. I had to take a principled conscience decision to be a peace builder. As Malcolm Muggeridge once said, only dead fish swim with the stream. You've had to <laughs> go against the stream. Yes. And in that process, have kind of opened up space for the church to kind of almost like reclaim itself or re re rediscover itself as being the salt and light of the world. I want to end with one last expression that I think summarizes what's going on in our church, in our world, with regard mm. to the planet. In, in every sense, we are moving into a new paradigm. Mm. We have new perspectives. We, under, we do understand quite a lot more. Mm. People are much more open. Mm. I'm amazed at how many people, lay people, priests and bishops, actually support us women priests. The priests and bishops are very much more careful. They'll mm. tell us. They mm. are frightened of coming out publicly, mm. except for somebody like Father Roy Bouchois, mm. who came to the ordination, but he has been defrocked mm -hmm. as a priest because of his support of us. So the others won't. However, in our church mm -hmm. and in our world and on our planet, I think our awareness is really opening mm -hmm. up and we are already, mm -hmm. what we've been saying this morning, we're in a new paradigm, mm -hmm. a new way of living and relating to one another, to the church, mm -hmm. to, uh, to our planet, You've been talking a lot about ecology in South Africa. As I've come back after all my years in Germany, mm -hmm. I am amazed at some of the breakdown of racism. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed and horrified that there's still so much of it mm -hmm. on both sides, mm -hmm. black and white. But we are in a new paradigm and that's very exciting mm -hmm. in the church and in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What my priest said to me the other day, she said, John, you know, the best criticism of the bad is the practice of the better. <laughs> so rather than go out there campaigning and pointing fingers and trying to be holier than thou and almost self-righteous, and we just need to get on and do it. And I think yeah. we as lay people, because we don't have those restrictions of the disciplines of the vows that we would have otherwise the priests have had to take we have a freedom yes. and with that freedom comes a, a huge responsibility so I would want to invite anybody who watches this who's a layman like me to respond in the comments and to offer your thoughts and your disagreements by all means too because by no means am I wanting to suggest you know that this is now 
you know, the new party to belong to, you know, all the others were all wrong and bad. Um, I was amazed at uh, Patricia telling me how I never knew that Vimpy de Klerk had a role to play in helping your seeds of consciousness to begin to, yes. to, to blossom and to incubate. Um, I've likewise had always been surprised that people outside of my own kind of club of Roman Catholicism have helped me understand, you know, the Gospels in a much more powerful way. Mm -hmm. So it's that sense of trying to be more and more and ever and more inclusive and to break down yes. whatever barriers exist that I think is so important. Which to finish off with that lovely phrase of Ben Ockley where he says, to free our histories for future flowerings. Yes. And that gels beautifully with another line which I forget who gave it to me, says, we have to go out on a limb because that's where the blossoms grow. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's true.